So um, welcome everybody and, and thanks very much for the invite to be here. I look forward to the interactive discussion. Um, I'm going to provide a little bit of uh, background to stimulate some thinking um, before we get into a case. So as per um, CPD guidelines, um, conflict of interest, there's no financial conflicts of interest. There's no discussion of pharmaceuticals. Um, I am a member of the uh, Speakers Bureau for a nonprofit organization. Um, and I'm there as a volunteer, no uh, financial relationship there. And I will be sharing some of the uh, materials that are shared through the nonprofit. Um, and then these are just general uh, conflict of interest uh, notes from this program overall, the ECHO program. And uh, the mitigating, mitigating those conflicts, there's... Um, Information provided today is explicitly evidence-based and has peer review. Um, so any recommendations um, are uh, based on scientific research. Uh, objectives today are to talk about evidence-based uh, forms of uh, psychotherapy that's relevant for older adults and with a greater focus on CBT specifically or cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, to share with you an enhanced model of CBT that we use, we've developed here at Dalhousie um, that's also being used in Ottawa. And to share with you some practical tools and resources that uh, are informed by CBT uh, available through uh, the nonprofit I mentioned. So what are some evidence-based uh, forms of late life psychotherapies? There's a bunch of them that are all sort of related to cognitive behavior therapy or variations on the theme. Um, hopefully these are familiar to you. Um, problem solving therapy, CBT for insomnia, uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, which is considered more like a third wave um, form. Behavioral activation, which is just purely looking at activating behaviors, which is is also related to the CBT model. And of course, I've mentioned an enhanced CBT group that um, is another form. And another subtype, interpersonal therapy, which is specifically recommended for depression. Um, late uh, life review, uh, sometimes also called reminiscence, although there's some distinctions. And dynamic therapy, which is kind of the original form of psychotherapy um, in the field. Okay. Rather than belabor the evidence, I just thought I would give a recent meta-analysis. So this, uh, this article in 2023 was a meta-analysis comparing effectiveness uh, specifically for late-life psychotherapies. Um, there were 68 studies uh, 4,000, more than 4,000 participants, and they were comparing six uh, different types. And in a nutshell, um, they found no major differences among some of these key uh, subtypes of psychotherapy. So CBT and behavior therapy um, and life review and a combined, and I thought interestingly enough, mindfulness, which is like a third wave CBT form. Um, kind of intervention, um, all were included in this, uh, in the uh, meta-analysis. And the ones with a star were ones that uh, showed effectiveness over an active control group, as opposed to wait, wait list or treatment as usual. So we know there are some good approaches to use with older people, but what do we mean by uh, life review therapy? That is about uh, looking at uh, or you know reflecting on one's life with a specific focus on it has a kind of CBT aspect to it, balancing positive and negative thoughts about our our, our narrative, our storyline, and then integrating it, uh, looking for uh, themes, and similarly like takes a, a bit of a cognitive uh, stance in redefining negative experiences. Um, 
to help resolve conflicts and accept and integrate. And then it also elaborates on memories as opposed to reminiscence therapy, which is uh, just re recollecting personal uh, experiences. So there's a bit more of a process around the life review. And I think it's relevant to think of this not just in a CBT way, but also in a developmental way. We know um, the, there aren't a lot of theories about development over the course of the lifespan, but Erickson's uh, uh, last phase in his uh, developmental model discusses a balance between despair versus integrity. So the idea that if we have a lot of stories about our lives that are have negative um, a negative tone and a negative meaning to us, then that could contribute to um, thoughts of despair as opposed to that sort of integrating them, reframing them and so on that's down in the life review. So you could see that that ability to put it all in perspective um, that can allow for a feeling of having a life worth having been uh, lived a life that's worthwhile and not ha not being over overwhelmed with regret and so on that um, it's been a meaningful life. And, and then another type of therapy that's uh, referred to in that meta-analysis is mindfulness. And I mentioned that it's kind of like third wave CBT as well. Um, there's a lot, a very large growing body of literature about this related to um, uh, like a stress reduction um, using mindfulness. So it's particularly good for those like agitated depressions and for anxiety. Um, and essentially what it is, is a increasing our ability to have moment to moment awareness, um, to be able to relax in the present without judgment. And it can, it's been associated with the development of more compassion for the self and others, as well as reduction of worry, improving well being improving mood and even cognition. Um, if you want to learn more about mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn is one of the major originators of bringing um, this practice into Western culture and to medicine. Um, and there's a really great brief YouTube video in which he he describes it um, here. And I, I won't I won't stop for that right now. If we have time, we can come back to that. And just to say, there's been a lot of research uh, in this meta-analysis, there's over 200 studies and 12,000 patients showing the effectiveness in reducing stress and anxiety with moderate effect sizes. And in terms of understanding why this works, like in the first example of life review, we're thinking about Erickson's developmental stages. When we think about um, why mindfulness works is it's really getting at um, the central nervous system in terms of like the autonomic nervous system and settling down that sort of sympathetic discharge or fight flight reaction to help people settle and, and be more in a parasympathetic state of calm alertness. Um, and a lot of uh, the understanding now why this works has to do with our understanding about the nature of the mind that without getting into a lot of detail, just because we're short on time for this today, but um, essentially, the mind is is um, evolved to serve as an alert system, um, and it has a, a limited attention span with a, a kind of tendency to scan for danger and an asymmetry referred to as the negativity bias, which is good for our survival, um, that we will remember negative things or potential threats in a way, and we will dwell on them in a way to protect ourselves um, so that we notice these negative things more with a greater affect than positive things. So for example, in your daily life, you could think about any time you might've felt a sting of re rebuke more strongly than the joy of praise as an example. So there's kind of like an, a sense in which a lot of the negative experiences that we have has to do with this circuitry of the brain that is so attuned to negative or threats. So the idea of uh, settling down that threat response to be able to enjoy the present moment without worrying about what we've done wrong in the past or 
fretting about what might go wrong in the future um, tends to have this really regulating effect on us. Um, the idea of uh, primary versus secondary pain is also written about in um, third wave and fourth wave CBT, which is um, essentially a lot of the misery that we experience as humans and certainly that our patients experience has to do with this dwelling on negatives and anticipating future negatives. Um, in other words, if we only have 15 minute attention span and we were capable of letting go whatever the most recent threat has been, um, then it wouldn't last for long. But because of this capacity of the mind to ruminate and continue to generate an anxious response, we cause the most of our pain and emotional pain and suffering is due to this circuitry. Um, so the 90% rule is that 90% of human suffering comes down to this nature of the mind. So when, uh, when we're talking about CBT, behavioral activation and enhanced CBT, let's, there's an interconnection between this and mindfulness. So we can get at um, this central nervous system, our an anxious states and depressive states through uh, settling the nervous system directly with our behaviors like deep breathing and so on. But we can also get at it um, by looking at these interrelated components. So what, are, what uh, thoughts are going through our mind? Are they positive or are they negative? So if I'm thinking about trying something new and I have some positive self-talk, it can help me actually overcome barriers and be able to take up that activity, let's say. So this, in this case, you might have a frail older patient and if, you, if they have positive thoughts about the idea of getting out for walks, they may be more likely to actually do that. And if they do, it can generate more positive mood states. And that's probably the cycle we see when we actually can activate um, positive thinking through CBT. We end up with improved mood and well being. And then the flip for behavioral activation is we just start in a different place on this triangle, this interrelated triangle. In this case, we'll get out for walks without having shifted any thinking. And by getting out for the walk, the person will end up with a more positive thought like, well, I can do this, I can fit this in. And that in turn will improve their mood state. So it doesn't really matter where you start. Um, except to say it's a lot easier to shift behaviors and thoughts than it is to directly work on the emotion um, unless you're you know, using the relaxation technique, the behavioral techniques. So the relevance of that second part, that behavioral activation for us in psychiatry is that this is not only good for treating depression and anxiety, but it's also really broadly useful for pretty much everything. Anytime you think about using non-pharmacological approaches with our patients, we need to use behavioral activation because we're asking them to shift behaviors. And it can be used in a proactive way to promote their health and prevent disease, um, as in this uh, quote by Ben Franklin. And the science of well being uh, points to, uh, the direction as to what areas we'd like to see people use behavioral activation for. Um, so, finding meaningful activities and having uh, maybe a journal to reflect on gratitude and scheduling time to be with people we love and um, behaving in compassionate ways. These are all things we can op operationalize and promote well being in a proactive way as well as reactive way. So when should we use uh, CBT itself as a treatment? Well, this is one of the great benefits of CBT has been very well studied and has evidence across many different disorders. So I've got some of them listed here. And you'll be familiar probably with a CBT for insomnia, very specific intervention around uh, sleep hygiene. There's a good, um, Ref, uh, resource there, sleepwell. My sleep, I should say mysleepwell.ca. But you can see you could um, really turn to CBT as a treatment for pretty much um, all the major um, areas of psychopathology that we deal with. And uh, I really appreciate this meta analysis um, that is relatively recent uh, for 2021 of over oh, nearly 500. Uh, 
reviews and over 200,000 patients. That says basically it works for whatever ails you. Um, <laughs> so there's a modest uh, benefit or medium effect size for pretty much anything that they looked at. Um, a general benefit um, for CBT across any condition, population, or context. So when you get enough evidence across enough areas, you can have a meta-analysis of this kind. Um, and then specifically enhanced CBT is taking the usual CBT approaches and modifying them further for older adults. So that's been an area of interest of mine over the last decade. Um, for example, uh, we've developed an enhanced model for group CBT for older adults. And the enhancements include things like reduced writing requirements, uh, using larger print, um, teaching people in a small group with a flip chart and their own little notebook and uh, offering midweek phone calls to help them with their homework and that kind of thing. So this helps them uh, increase compliance with the intervention and applying it in their life. And um, our own uh, approach here at Dalhousie was a nine week manualized program, two hours a week using those uh, types of techniques. And what we found here in Dell was uh, moderate to large effect sizes on the Hamilton and the Peck, Beck and, perce and perceived quality of life um, in the uh, nine week program. And this has been replicated just recently. We're still um, in the process of getting our manuscript ready in Ottawa with a sample size that was twice as large. Um, so this is an uncontrolled uh, study, obviously. It's, a, well, within subject, pre-post control, you could say, but it's it doesn't have a comparison group. Um, so if you're interested in uh, learning more about the, the enhanced CBT program, I'm happy to answer questions about that. Um, I mentioned this nonprofit, and this was developed by myself and colleagues to try and help share basically the science about behavioral activation and behavior change and CBT principles with a wider audience. Um, since we know it works and it works for whatever ails you, it'd be good if more people were aware of how, how to apply it and what the basic principles are. So we have clinician tools. Um, we have a course to train clinicians on how to use the materials in their practice. Um, and we have workshops and so on for, for the public. And there's also um, a free web-based app to help you with behavior uh, activation and tracking called the Wellness App. And this, um, we've done a project to try to bring it into clinical practice um, using this approach here called the Thrive Approach to Wellbeing, which is both a model and a method. So using behavioral uh, activation uh, approaches, we ask people to assess how they're doing in these uh, sort of five domains of patterns of thinking, what their health habits are, relationships, their interests, and emotional self-regulation, and do a self-assessment is step one. And step two, to set a goal in one of these areas and document that. And step three is to track that um, for about a month. And so this uh, uh, definition of thrive is the ability to meet one's goals despite setbacks or circumstances. And it's also in this case of this model, it's an acronym, yeah, these, these terms um, that was just outlined. And it also um, integrates this behavioral activation science. So thoughts has to do with cognit cognitions, like our self-assessment. Um, health habits includes uh, nutrition and exercise, lifestyle medicine science. Relationships has to do with, you know, interventions to alleviate loneliness and isolation. And interests has to do with like engaging your whole brain in interesting and absorbing activity. Uh, emotions has to do with what, that mindfulness stuff and the ability to self-regulate the negativity bias directly through behavioral and relaxation methods. And then the V for valued goals is that behavior activation. Like what is the goal that we're working towards? Okay, so when we talk about behavior activation, this is the commonly approached, uh, approached uh, uh, method, which is to set a very specific goal. So SMART goals uh, are defined as being very specific, meaningful, action-oriented, realistic, and time-limited. 
And as mentioned, the relevance of this is not only to treat um, illness at a later stage, like whether it's depression, anxiety, or any of these other um, disorders that were listed earlier, but also to use this in a proactive way um, to prevent relapse, recurrence, um, or or just to promote well-being. And in this methodology that we've used, um, we encourage people to set a very small goal that's actually doable for them so that they can adhere to it and receive the, the benefit of, of the, what's called the cognitive ripple effect. So one small change leads to those uh, positive self-talk, which then leads to a feeling of self-efficacy. And that's the key to behavior change is um, when you can adhere to the goal that you've set, you have increased self-efficacy, which leads to more internal motivation to keep it going. This is the same model that's used in any uh, behavior change uh, program, for example, like across North America that's used in healthcare. The one that was purchased by my area, my institute um, is uh, Your Way to Wellness, which is based on this program developed um, by Ola Olander. Um, but all the, all the behavior change, all the sort of self-management programs that are out there are, are using this kind of methodology. Um, so the benefit of uh, using a behavioral change approach is that when people meet the goal, they have positive self-talk, which then improves you know, their out outcomes. And when they don't meet the goal, they can use supportive self-talk in order to come up with a more suitable goal for themselves. So the idea in this model is to help people shift a small behavior and then adhere to it um, that over time, you can have big, big improvements in their health outcomes. So if you can make a tiny shift in a positive direction in any of these areas and hold on to that change over time, you can get really major impacts on um, health outcomes over the long term. So the analogy being an airplane that sets off in a direction that's maybe five degrees difference. It won't make a difference in where it lands after a few minutes, but after a few hours, it could really change its 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 destiny. So uh, the Fountain of Health organization of the association collaborated with the CCSMH um, in 2018 to share these approaches with over 2000 clinicians. They had a 30 minute training session on how to use this behavioral activation approach, which is based in CBT. And um, they were asked to use this with their patients and to provide a one month follow-up. And they had some measures uh, pre-post uh, health and resilience questionnaire and goal attainment scaling and so on. So these are the tools that we made available that are you know, informed by CBT, um, the wellness app, um, a change behavior change toolkit, and there was a video as well. And uh, what we found in that uh, study is that when clinicians used this approach with their patients, um, about 80% of the time, the patients at least partially met that health goal in a one month follow up and also had reported improved well being and health attitudes. And we had a couple of publications out of that, which are shared here. And so this approach is included in. Uh, recommended uh, practices in the uh, Mental Health Commission of Canada. And just in terms of final thoughts on resources, if you would like to make some of this uh, available for free to your patients, we have a project on the, on the go at the moment with uh, Wellness Together Canada with free webinars for patients and families on, on, on how to apply uh, CBT approaches for themselves. So the um, the the um, flyer here on the right outlines some of those offerings. These are just educational materials um, offered through February, but the upcoming ones in April, April 2nd and 5th, um, one in English and one in French are still available. And the focus is on that model, the Thrive model, um, with a focus on self-compassion, sort of like talking to ourselves in a more compassionate way. So if you're interested to make this available to your patients, um, you're welcome uh, to have them scan that QR code and they can sign up for free. 
Um, and then oh, I mentioned also the wellness app, which is web-based. It's free. You just need a, your own email address and an internet to use this. Um, you don't go to an app store. You just use it like it's a website. Um, and uh, it allows people to receive um, some help in setting their own behavioral activation goal. So I'll stop there. <laughs>